thanks for joining me on jamaicans.com for another shelf life as always like the page drop a comment in the section below and share this with your friends Today on Shelf Life, my guest is a gentleman who, for most of us, needs no introductions. If you grew up in Jamaica in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s, the name, the Honorable R. Danny Williams, will mean something to you. That name is synonymous with the insurance industry in Jamaica. And he was the founder and president of Life of Jamaica, which is now Sajikor. To detail all of his accolades and all his honors, would take me all day. And so I won't be able to do that, but he deserved every single one of those honors. In reading his biography, I tried to make a difference, which was written by Sandy McIntosh. I learned so much about the man himself, so much I would never have thought of. I'm honored to have with me today, our Danny Williams. Let's chat. So oh, welcome, Mr. R. Danny Williams. Danny, I am so thrilled to have you on my show. Uh, I, as I said to my, my viewers when I was starting, if you grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, <laughs> right into today, and you don't know the name R. Danny Williams, it means that you would never grow up. <laughs> it means that you never <laughs> come from Jamaica and you don't know nothing at all. Welcome to Shelf Life. Thank you, my dear. It's a pleasure to be with you. This book gives us such great insight into who you are as a person. Because growing up, you know, R. Danny Williams, the R. Danny Williams building, the LOJ buildings were landmarks, but we never really know anything about you. So this is our chance to get to really know you and who you are. Growing up in the 30s, what was that like for you? Family life. Well, I was born in 1934. And then the war came in 1939 when I was only five years old. And so I remember the thirties as being the war years. Okay. And because those, that, that was a time when everything was short and um, in terms of imports, but Jamaica was producing a lot for itself. Mm -hmm. um, that, we, that were sounds never, like my we're years. Of, we were never short of food or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But you know, when rice came into a neighborhood, um, a bag of rice, everybody shared it. Okay. So I, I remember that period uh, in the 30s, as I said, born 34, the war started 39, I was only about five years old, and then it went on until I was about 11 years old. So I remember that period as being a period where people just simply worked together and um, would listen every six o'clock every afternoon to the BBC shortwave radio as to what was happening in the, in the war. And um, people just had to make life for themselves. Nobody was going anywhere. Um, German U-boats were out there, you know, um, just outside our shores. So um, people just stayed put. That, and, that is and, interesting. And they then worked together, you know. That's and interesting share. because you rarely ever hear anybody talk about the war years from a Jamaica perspective. You know, you kind yeah. of think of the war as being over there so somewhere and it never have anything to do with me and you. But it's nice to hear you talk about that. What about your family? How big a family? What was it like growing up in terms well, of your family? Mother, father, um, two sisters and myself. And um, my mother came from a fairly large family a very large family in fact. And um, we, we were close. As a, gen a family generally, we were very close. And as I said, during those war years, nobody was going abroad or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So the members of the family were here. And you visited with each other. Um, we had a happy family. Um, as you know, and as you read in the book, um, they, we were not wealthy people. My father was an accountant, accounting clerk at JPS. My mother never had a formal schooling like St. Andrew High. And so on. she went to some private schooling. And at 15 or 16, she started. She was a good dressmaker. Okay. Teamstress, and she was very good. I mean, she's one of these people who could just stand up beside you with the, the fabric. And, yeah, 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 fine. And then just go and cut it, you know. 
Uh, I had so, an aunt like that. <laughs> so we had, um, she did her dressmaking from home. My father, as I said, worked and we always had guests in our house. We always had boarders in because we needed the extra revenue. And, but we were never hungry. We, we were always comfortable. We, I remember us being very happy to tell you the truth. <laughs> in fact, as you, as you talk about borders, as you talk about having borders, there's a, a part in your book where you talk about your bed actually being in the passageway because okay. you had borders. <laughs> and it's, That's cool. yeah, it's funny reading stuff like that because we always just think of people who have reached a certain status in life as if they were born there, you know? Yes. And yes, yes. so many of us didn't come from money, but we don't know that. You know, people see you at a certain stage of life and they think, oh, have money. But they don't understand that, you know, you started somewhere humble. And so that was wonderful to be able to read is that, you know, you came from, in fact, as we talk about started humble, you started being an entrepreneur from a very young age. Tell me the cigarette story, because that was funny. Well, the, the fact of the matter was, as I said, we didn't have a great deal. We had enough, but we didn't have a great deal. I wanted more pocket money. And um, my father said, I can't give it to you. And so he says, well, as I, I came also from a family where a lot of the, my mother's um, family were small entrepreneurs. One ran a gas station and things like that. And so we had it sort of in our blood that, you know, if you, you must go into some kind of business if you want to make some money. Okay. And my mother's father was a, a merchant. And um, so it kind of ran in the blood, you might say. And so he said, well, he and I sat down, discussed it, came up with the idea that at that time, you know, he didn't have motor cars. There were no motor cars around. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody rode a bicycle. We didn't have any um, access to the, the, the store just down the road kind of thing. And um, so we came up with the idea. And I should tell you, also in those days, everybody smoked. Yes, it was that time. Of, it was that yes, time, it actually. Was that time where everybody smoked cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And um, so we came up with the idea of why not distribute um, cigarettes in the neighborhood? And on top of that, in the whole road area where I was living, um, a lot of new little houses were being built. So you had a lot of workmen out there who would buy cigarettes from you um, during the day. And my helper kept the business going for me when I was at school <laughs> because, you know, guys would come by and buy a stick of cigarette. But Jamaica, I, I think it's probably the only place <laughs> I know where you can buy one stick of cigarettes. <laughs> you started, is you, is you. So <laughs> we, I carried on the business from there and um, did well. I used to distribute cigarettes to the, those in the, who lived in the homes around mm -hmm. um, twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays, took my bicycle and rode around. At the end of the month, I would go and collect. Um, mm -hmm. My father had financed the business, you know, with okay. a couple of cartons of cigarettes. And, um, that was that my was capital. Business. But I will tell you this, I saved a hundred pounds out of that, which was a lot of money in those mm -hmm. days out of my cigarette distribution business. <laughs> That's a whole heap of money back then, you know. So yes, let's, you let can. us put that in terms that the young people today could understand, can understand. So a hundred pounds back then would be like mm -hmm. having what? About a hundred thousand dollars today. US. <laughs> wow, no, see? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, a hundred pounds then was I'm just thinking in terms of what it would buy today, you know? Yeah, probably yeah, about, yeah, probably about a hundred thousand dollar worth of groceries and oh yes, oh, appliances yes. and stuff. That was a lot of money because I'm from the pound pence and um shilling and pence era. And yes. I can remember, you know, trop and spatty, trop and cocoa bread and six months <laughs> drink. And he a penny to go to shop to buy sweetie. So <laughs> we're talking about a whole heap of money back then. So you've well, been I a top of your from long time. I think once you mentioned, you know, that a patty was a throw on three pence, which was three out of 12 pence in a shilling. Yes. And they were um, 20 shillings in a pound. Mm -hmm. And to have a hundred pounds, 
uh, it gives you a relevance that way. Yeah, you can multiply it by patty. You know, when I was raising, <laughs> when I was raising my kids, I used to equate things to chicken, you know. Am I going to buy that or not? No, that can buy one chicken. And that is five dinners. So no, I'm not buying it because I need the five dinners. So yes, I get it. We equate it to patty. <laughs> so you got into the business of retail and you also at one point were working in some kind of manufacturing kind of setting, but you did quite a few things and then you found out, you realized that you had this love of selling. Now, for me, your story of how you got into insurance was really, really ingenious. And I, want, I don't want to give away the whole book because I want them to buy the book. So I want, but I wanted to share that story of how you actually got into insurance when you really should not have been selling insurance. <laughs> well, actually, from I was about 16, um, my brother-in-law, my sister who had gotten married, um, and my brother-in-law lived with us. Because again, it was a period of time where, you know, you couldn't afford to go out and rent an apartment for yourself. So they lived at home um, with us. He, had, he was in the life insurance business selling, and he'd bring the books home. And I started reading the books that he brought home. Well, as I said, I came from a family of people who were always involved in selling. I had had my successful business. So this idea of selling and so on was just natural for me. And so I started reading all these books. And then I started, um, remember, at this time I'm in fifth form, sixth form, and some boys are leaving school at fifth form. In those days, very few went on to sixth form. Right. And, and they'd go and get a job um, graduating from JC. They would go and get a job in the civil service, which was a very important job to get at that time. And I would introduce him to these boys who would got their first jobs and um, help him to make a sale. I don't have to say that I, I must admit that I, I didn't do it for free. Clearly. You had to pay a spotter's fee yes. for doing so. I became even more interested because, you know, as I said, I never had a lot of money, so I knew that I had to do things to make extra money mm -hmm. in order to so in, in order to do what I wanted to do. And so that was how I became interested in the business. And then when I left school, finally at age 18, uh, um, stick a pin. Was, stick a pin for me, Danny. And you went to JC, was it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, of course. He says that like there's no other school. You realize that? <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, there is no other school. <laughs> Boy, Mr. Yes. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Keep going. Yes, so when I did leave school, um, I got a job with my friend Desmond Mayer's father, Gerald Mayer, in the accounting firm. That didn't last two months because I used to drop asleep. I just couldn't take the boredom of it. Boring. Boring. And then I had another opportunity to work at Cayman Estates. They were establishing an anhydrous alcohol plant, which was a substitute for gasoline. And again, I had quite a drama there and eventually. But the truth of the matter was that even during that period of time, because I used to work shifts at night shifts and so on, mm -hmm. I would come into town during the day and um, do some work along with my brother-in-law. And so I maintained that contact throughout that period. But you know, the idea of Mr. and Mrs. Williams, the son that they had sacrificed so much for, to send to JC, and my mother had worked into all hours at night, mm -hmm. making clothes for people in order to pay the school fees. Um, you know, he should go to university. And be a doctor. Oh, well, become a professional of some yeah, kind. Because back well, then, doctor, lawyer, you had to be a professional of some kind. And back then, insurance wasn't even considered a professional. No, insurance was, uh, was not considered as a, a worthwhile profession mm -hmm. um, as such. And um, I did get admitted to Guelph University to do agricultural chemistry. But the truth was, they just didn't have the money. We couldn't put the money together. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just continued um, in the insurance business. And um, that, that in itself was a bit of a, a drama because I was only 18, um, 18 and a half years old. And um, you couldn't get licensed. Uh, you couldn't get a bond until you were 21. Okay. 
And so for, uh, I used to sell part-time through my brother-in-law. Using his bond. Using his, his contract. Mm -hmm. And so um, well, that eventually, we worked that out eventually by my father guaranteeing the bond <laughs> without going into all the details. Yes, no details so here. My own contract. Actually got it on my birthday, the 3rd of July, um, 1953. So I finally got my own contract. And, and tell you the truth, I was successful from the word go. Well, that, I, that does not surprise anybody because to have reached where you reached, you had to have had that drive and known that success was just something you were not going to live without. And when you read the book and just... The, the, the step from even the stories about the alcohol plant, I'm not giving it away because it is hilarious and you have to get <laughs> the book and I'm not giving away the whole book. But even that, just knowing that sometimes people don't realize the stepping stones that you take and that you have yeah. to get to where you want to go. And I think your life and this book should be required reading. I think I've said that to one other person only. Should be required reading for our young people this book should be something that them read in high school to understand that when you get out of high school and when you go to college and get out of college, there's not this big pie waiting for you. You still have to put in the work. You know, you still have to put in the work and your work paid off because you ended up being the founder of something we all know about. People still call Sajikor L.O.J. <laughs> yes, yes. People still call That's it the L.O.J. building. So, how did life of jamaica come about well i was in the life insurance business i saw where um although the business was successful and many of us were making a decent living out of it that the business wasn't doing anything for jamaica mm. because everything every dollar that we earned was being shipped to canada or to england um, because we had about 17 companies from this canada america and england in Jamaica. We only had one small Jamaican company, Jamaica Mutual, that wasn't doing all that marvelously well. And all the pros, all the funds were not being used to develop Jamaica at all, but were being shipped abroad. We did nothing for ourselves. Not even our envelopes were wow. bought low. I tell you better, even the urine samples were sent abroad. What? That, that was the degree at which, at which we operated. And so, I, I saw this need. Prior to that, I'd had the experience, just a couple of years before, of being invited by Douglas Fletcher to become, because at the time I had done very well, I was fairly well known, the life of Jamaica, uh, North American life had done so well, so I was fairly well known as a young budding businessman. Mm -hmm. And so Douglas Fletcher invited me uh, as the only youngster to the board of the newly formed citizens man. Okay. And so I lived through that experience of forming a company, which I must tell you taught me a great deal. And Especially in Jamaica. Jamaica. Especially in Jamaica, where it's not a simple task. <laughs> no. And so um, I saw this opportunity and I said, this doesn't make sense. We're, we're not doing anything. We're not developing our country. And in all fairness, to, I must give a certain credit to Eddie Siaga, because a year before Eddie Siaga, had spoken to me uh, along these lines and said, you know, Danny, you're the obvious person to do it. Why don't you form? At the time, I told him I wasn't ready. And subsequently, when I was ready and I went to see him, I, I want to give him the credit that he gave me support, without which I could never have formed Life in Jamaica. Mm. And so we went on to form the company so as to be able to create the professions. We didn't have any actors in Jamaica. We had one actor who had just come back that was Daisy Cook. Otherwise, we didn't have any actors. Wow. We didn't have any investment companies. You know, we had Citizens Bank had just been formed with 50% mm -hmm. ownership bar in Jamaica. Uh, just prior to that, BNS, knowing that Citizens Bank was coming, right. they quickly popped and, and, and went and offered 25% of their shares to the Jamaican public. So things are starting to happen. Right. And you must remember, this is 1970. Yes. We got independence in 62. And let me tell you, that was the greatest, one of the greatest times to have lived in Jamaica. Because everybody was all about, we must start doing things for the country. 
It was a Someone wonderful, make wonderful make time. Bit, that Sorry. whole late 60s into the 70s was just a wonderful time of coming into our own as Jamaicans, learning right. how to own as Jamaicans and learning that we can own and that we can be our own masters in Jamaica. Because I'm a, I'm a 60s baby, 70s girl. So I'm, <laughs> that was my period of, boy, Jamaicans, we can do this. Boy, you mean we can do that? We can do that, you know? And so Life of Jamaica was, of course, where I got my first health insurance, like most people I know. Um, and so it, for us, it was just a real awakening that, wow, it's Jamaican insurance company because, you know, our parents had insurances with all the other companies yes. that were about from wherever and they come from all over the place. So Life of Jamaica was something special because it Very. was Jamaican. It was our own. And if I remember, you launched in June of 1970. Correct. Yes. yes. A big launch. Yet it was massive. I mean, you know, it didn't matter we where. We Jamaica that day. I Planes know. flew overhead with streamers. Every radio station blasted it. And remember, at that time, it wasn't hard to cover the whole country. And, and we only um, had one TV station, so it didn't matter. When you turn it on, the only thing you could see was LOG. Everybody had to look at it. <laughs> you had no choice. <laughs> there was no internet to turn away to, no YouTube okay. to watch, no video. No, 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 no. Funny, when I think about the fact that in 1970, we never even had VCR, you know, <laughs> you turn on, yeah, you turn on JBC when it turn on and when the night come and the anthem come and it, it go to the, the color bar, it's done, it done. You got to your bed. I, yeah, yes. I got to You're so right. <laughs> but, you know, it was a wonderful period in which to have lived. And, and uh, I'm so happy that I was fortunate enough to have lived through that particular period mm -hmm. and to have had the opportunity to have um, formed Life of Jamaica because Life of Jamaica has meant a lot to Jamaica. Yes, it has. It, um, you know, we, it is as a result of Life of Jamaica that the other insurance, some uh, Oliver Jones and the others, mm -hmm. formed local companies. It was as a result of Life of Jamaica and Island Life and so on, taking over the foreign companies, yes. so we, we bought out all of them. Yes. We were able to acquire all of them. And so it became a truly local industry. It, it was a wonderful time. And what you did and all the others who followed uh, was just an amazing thing. But before we, we, we talk about, continue to talk about life insurance and end the show on life insurance, there is so much more to this book. Um, that was fascinating, by the way, was reading about the LOJ because, you know, as again, you grew up and LOJ is a household name. But there was so much more. There's so much more about you and the fact that you are very, very big into people and helping people. And to be able to read about all the people you've mentored and helped and done so much for. This compassion that you have for people. And a lot of people think that, you know, life insurance people are really just about trying to get you to buy a policy. But <laughs> my, what I have found out from my personal experience and many friends that I have that are in insurance is that they really do care. They mm -hmm. honestly care. And I think you were able to pass that on to your the people who worked with you. Has that mm -hmm. culture of caring continued? Because you're, you're the chairman of the board for Sagicor now, correct? No, not anymore. Not no. anymore. But did, did that culture okay, pass down? No, no. So, uh, they're putting me on the shelf now. <laughs> well, this is shelf life, so it's a perfect place <laughs> for you. But um, that culture of honestly caring, has that culture passed down even though you are no longer actively involved? In Sagicor? I mean, for example, Sajikor has a foundation. I'm actually chairman of that foundation. Oh, okay. And we, we give, um, we invest a lot in education and health. And we've just given 50 scholarships. I mean, just to give you an example. Right. Tertiary scholarships. Um, we invest 1% of the total net profit of the company in charitable things. But the truth of the matter is that um, I saw my parents live the kind of life where you're always helping those who were in need. Yes. Um, we very often had to help our own relatives who were in need. Sometimes they had to come and live with us because that was 
necessary as many Jamaican families have experienced. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 my mother and father were, um, were very religious, mm -hmm. uh, not born again Christians because Seventh-day Adventists and Roman Catholic, but they were always involved in the, the charitable um, affairs. Let me, the, let me stick um, a pin um, right there because um, I'm a Christian. I, I have issues with the whole idea of this not being born again and that not being born again to me, Christians are Christians. But I tell you one thing, with a Catholic background, I grew up in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. and I have never seen any set of people, whatever other issues they may have, give as much as they. And that's, for me, that's where I learned compassion. That's where I learned to give. And so, yes, I agree with you that, that having that religious background and my, my parents were like yours too. They gave mm -hmm. away, my mother gave away everything. If I miss a dress, <laughs> it's gone, it's gone. She would look at me and say, I will see you wear that dress for about six months now. Christine needed that dress. Go for my dress, my dress, gone. So <laughs> that whole thing of giving is so very much a part of you from everything I've read in the book. Well, I was also exposed to the fact that my eldest sister was mongloid or Down syndrome. Okay. And so I was exposed to handicapped people as well. Mm, so I had that experience. Um, my father-in-law, Lister Muir, um, was chairman of the Jamaica Association to the Deaf. I offered my service to him when I was only about 20 years old mm -hmm. and I got involved. He died as a young man and I, the Bishop Gibbs insisted that I take over the chairmanship of the Jamaica Association for the Deaf. But the truth of the matter was that throughout our life, we've always lived in that kind of situation where you yes. share. Yes. And as I say, from the war years, from family, that was just part of the way of life. And so I've enjoyed, I've always said that I must always be doing something. And I, as a result, I, I, um, I, I, was, I was involved in the junior chamber, um, Jamaica Association, there's the Jamal program. Oh, that was love a that program. interesting program. Yes, love um, that program. I taught Jamal. Oh, you taught Jamal? Yeah, Good. as a high school student. We taught yeah. Jamal. There were, we yeah. All group. of my children who were high school students yeah. at the time taught Jamal. Uh, that was a wonderful program. And a program that should I come back. I had the privilege of working with Dr. Joyce Robinson, a fantastic woman. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I've always been involved. You know, I got involved with the um, uni university mm -hmm. through my mentor, Douglas Fletcher, and his son, um, we decided that Jamaica needed a private facility. And so the Tony Sway Swing was born and we raised all the capital locally to do it. And so it has just been part of my life to be in, to devote a portion of time every day, every week, every month, every year to things that helped. And That's I've enjoyed cool. it. I love, you see, I've always felt life insurance business was helping people. Mm, it, and it is. I it regarded is. the insurance business as not as a means of making a living, but I felt it was helping people. Mm -hmm. And so everything that I was associated with, um, I, I enjoy helping people. I don't even remember when I helped somebody. <laughs> no more and that, people and that's the truth. That's a true test of doing it remember. from the heart is that you don't remember, you don't keep score. But listen, I have to get to you and Shirley. <laughs> because the love story of Danny and Shirley is a part of the book. In two sentences, I cut them have to read it. <laughs> Tell us about your beloved Shirley. Met her by crashing her 13th birthday party. <laughs> um, when I was 14 and a half, took a shine to her. We, we would meet at little parties in between. At her 16th birthday party, by this time I've got to know her. So I got the legitimate invitation. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she looked like she was taking a shine to me too. So um, <laughs> by this time, and at her 16th birthday, um, I made my pitch and she wow. rejected me <laughs> <laughs> on the basis that I was, she had noticed me at the parties that I was a flirt. And so I set out to prove to her I wasn't a flirt. The result was that um, a week before I was 20, we got married. <laughs> she, was, uh, she wasn't pregnant at the time. 
She cut out the flirting man. She end the flirting good and proper. Done, done, she done. Knock out the flirting man. <laughs> knock out all the flirting. And so we um and then and we've been married now for sixty six years. She's been a phenomenal supporter for me. She's been supporting me in everything that I've ever done. And there've been a lot of times where if I were her, I would have left me. <laughs> Because, you know, there were some really hard times mm -hmm. where, because of all the things I was involved in mm -hmm. and, and the lack of time um, for family and home. But we had six children too, remember? Right. We had five children in the first six or seven years of marriage. Wow. So we didn't lose any time. <laughs> but we, we, we were, we had a, we've had a lovely life, a happy life. Um, we still love each other. And... Um, and it, it's been a wonderful life supporting each other. That is and, brilliant. That, that was the romance, just because she thought that was a flirt. <laughs> That's a, that is brilliant. That is brilliant. That is a brilliant, <laughs> brilliant story. So to wrap this all up, what are the takeaways from your book? What is it that you want people to know about you? What do you want people to feel? What do you want them to, especially young people, to know and to get from your book? I want the young people to realize that um, what they come and see today didn't just happen. Mm -hmm. I want them to realize where we're coming from and all the things, notwithstanding all the warts on our country um, and the particular difficulties right now, but to realize where we have come from. They don't know the history and, and what, I mean, when Jamaica got independence, 50% of our country was illiterate. Yes. They don't know all of this background. I want them to understand that background and, and to realize that we have a lot to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the other thing I want them to do is to realize that it don't matter where you come from. It don't matter where, whether you're born in riches or, or out of, you know, you don't have to be born in riches or a wealthy family in order to do well. You can do well if you're prepared to pay the price of hard work. You're prepared to pay the price of studying your profession and paying the price of hard work and working and caring with what you do and not do it just for money because money can only do so much. Mm -hmm. What is really important is sharing your life and, and, and helping to make wherever you live a different place. Try and make a difference. What I keep. <laughs> as, the, as the book said, I tried to make a difference. And on that note, that is a wonderful note on which to end this amazing conversation with you. As I said, I've been honored to have you on my show. I am, I am better for having spoken to you and read your book because it is inspirational and it is truth. You, uh, it was written just honestly and from the heart. Thank you so much for the gift of you to Jamaica, the gift of your life and your talent and all that you have given to Jamaica and the gift of this book that will live on long after for people to know and to learn and to appreciate from. Thank you very much for being here. You're most welcome. And I'd just like to add that all proceeds from the book goes to the Danny Williams Scholarship Fund at Jamaica College to give scholarships to needy boys, um, bright needy boys. And this year alone, we gave 30 scholarships. Ah, oh, brilliant, brilliant. And my readers will be able to find it and watchers, sorry, will be able to find it on Amazon and it's all over the place. I know I got mine on Amazon. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, you have got to get this book. It is worth it. It's a life of a true Jamaican icon who have a whole heap of letters behind his name that I can't <laughs> call half of those letters. But yes, thank you very much. It has been my pleasure having you on Shelf Life. Thank you. I appreciate this very much. Thanks for joining me on Shelf Life today. Man, what a man. What an honor to have been able to chat with him. I'll see you again next week, same place, same time, to see what else is on my shelf. In the meantime, check out my website, jfallonreed.com, to learn more about Shelf Life, more about me, and to catch up on the shows you've missed. Catch you again next week, same place, same time. Walk with